on what what the, what the book of Revelations has had to say about certain things. And I kind of gave you an idea of, of how I like to do this study of the book of Revelations because the book of Revelations is actually written in sections. It's written in sections. And to understand the sections that it's written in, sometimes it's easier instead of starting right at the very beginning to start in, a, in, a, in an area where we can see it and understand it and then work our way backwards. Um, if you've seen some, so, some ways that they, they do uh, uh, movies out there, you know, you, you, some of your better movies, or not better, but favorite movies out there, um, they'll show something that happened, and then a little bit later on, it'll come back and it'll say six hours earlier or eight hours earlier or whatever, just, just so you have an idea. So you know when you look at this part of it, what it's in reference to. The book of Revelation is written so that, so that God give, gives us not only the book of Revelation, but God gives us uh, a lot of books in the Bible that talk about uh, prophecy, end time prophecy. Revelation is just one of the books that everybody looks at. But in order to understand Revelation, we have to go outside of the book of Revelation as well as staying in Revelation because the book of Revelation is covered in other books as well. And so um, tonight's study, what I'd like to do tonight um, is... A pastor would ask me if we could do like a, a, a study, right? Open up Revelation chapter one and just start going through verse by verse. Um, and I, I mentioned that in order to get what we have, what we have to understand out of the book of Revelation, I thought it would be better if we did some steps. But I think tonight would be a good time to to do to start that with Thank you. with chapter one uh, because it's going to in, introduce us to this step. Uh, which actually ends up being in Revelation chapter 6, um, which is uh, the, the, the seven seals. Okay, Revelation chapter 6 talks about the seven seals. The seven seals is actually the first thing that the book of Revelation tells us about, or talks to us about, as being prophetic. Okay? This our version is okay, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, as, as being prophetic. Okay? Uh, so, so to understand it, uh, and, and the reason I, again, I like the King James, so a lot of times I, I do things out of the King James, and that's kind of why I brought this one, <laughs> this one in, because it's King James. Because King James Version Bible, when you read the King James Version Bible, it almost preaches itself. <laughs> and it does it without somebody else's commentary or, or whatever. It, it, it does it on its own. And, and the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, the very first three chapters of the book of Revelation, is God, is God talking to the churches. And he wants us to understand what is going on in the churches. So, so it's, it's, it's important to understand what's going on in the churches at the time that he's talking to John, okay, in Revelation. Um, so, it, it, you know, you have your Bibles, and it's, you, you can read along with me. It's just, I know King James Version I can quote it. <laughs> yeah. So just get into King James if you don't mind reading our version. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you read your version, so, and I'll read it. And okay. you'll, be able to, you'll be able to go right along with okay. it. You'll okay. hear the words that the King James uses, okay. and right. then you'll see what the differences might be between the two as Amen. well. Okay. If, if, all right. Right. If something completely different, hey, speak up. Well, they say this. Well, why? <laughs> why is that? And and we can have a discussion on that because sure. again, the most important thing to know is what is God trying to tell us. Okay, that's what I, I believe is, is what is God trying to tell us? And sometimes I can have an understanding or an interpretation of something here that that um, becomes clearer when you read other versions. I read other versions of, of, of the Bible just so I can have an understanding of what I just read and am I understanding it correctly? And if I'm not, it helps me clarify what I just read. So Revelation, um, and so we may not get very far into the, uh, uh, in, into the seven seals, which is, it's an important study to let us know where we are right now, current day. Okay. okay. Because the book of Revelation is written, again, like I said, it's written in sections. The first three chapters of the book of Revelation, he's talking to the churches. Okay. First chapter, he's talking about who he is and, and how powerful he is. The second and third chapter, he's talking about the churches, the angels, the stars, and the candlesticks. Okay. And they represent the church. And again, it's not me saying they represent the church. The, book, the, the, the Bible tells us that's what they are. Then chapter 4 kind of explains uh, things that are leading up to chapter 6. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 are letting us know the exact 
uh, time frame or, or, or things that are taking place, and they're letting us know these are the things which shall be hereafter. The book of Revelation is written for the things which are, the things which thou hast seen, and the things which shall be hereafter. So it's talking three sections. And in the first three chapters, he lets us know the things that are and the things that he has seen, write that. Then in chapter four, he says, now, here are the things which shall be hereafter. By stating that, he lets me know that it's chapter four that starts prophecy. Okay. 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 Chapter one, two, and three is actually the church itself. Okay? It's talking to you and me. The seven churches of Asia. But when he talks to the seven churches of Asia, guess what? There's only one church. <laughs> that's his church. Okay? There's only one church, and that's his church. So if he's talking to the seven churches of Asia, he's talking to you and me. Okay. Amen. Okay? He's not talking to just something that was in existence then. He's saying, here's what was going on in the church then. And some of it was bad. Some of it was good. But here's what it was. But I want you to understand... I have you. <laughs> I have your back. I've got you covered. Pastor was saying in there during prayer time that there are certain things that he wants to see take place. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are talking all about that. And that's kind of why I believe this is the way that we should go. So Revelation chapter 1. And uh, this... Uh, and I'm not sure in your... Is your Bible red letter or not? No? No, no. no, 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 no. Okay. This one is red letter edition as well. So um, if you've ever read the red letter edition of the Bible, they, they attribute the actual red letter words as being Jesus speaking right, those words. Right, right. Um, is it true? Is it not? I don't know 100% if that is. Whoever interpreted it to think that that's what it was. So don't always take it as a surety that red letter means Jesus actually spoke that. But more, more than likely, probably he did. Okay, but I wasn't there, so I can't prove it. Yeah, I don't like to say something that I can't prove. Okay, uh -huh. so in, even in all of my studies that I do, regardless of what those studies are, I like to prove them out. I like to prove them out. Um, so I like to take the Bible and let the Bible prove things out and then take science that's out there today and let science prove the same things out. Okay, because science will never argue with the Bible. If science is saying something that's contrary to the Bible, guess which one's wrong? <laughs> I know. <laughs> all science is, all science is, is somebody's theory. That's all science is. Science is theory. The yes. word of God is true. Science, it's fact. Science is a temporary truth. It really is. Until it changes all the something. time. Perfect way to say it right there. New word, right? Perfect way to say it there. So chapter 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass... <clears throat> And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. So he's letting us know. I'm letting you know my angel is talking to John. Okay. And this is my word so that you'll know what's going to be taking place in the last days. Right. Okay. I want you to understand that this is what's going to be happening. Okay. So he says, I'm letting my servant John give that to you. So he says, who bear record of the word of God. And of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So John's letting you know. I'm telling you the things that I saw. Right. I'm writing that down. Those things that I saw. Okay. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. And it's more at hand today than it's ever been at hand. Yeah. Even back in the day when John wrote this 2,000 years ago, they were waiting for the quick return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And as far as God is concerned, we're talking two days. Right. Okay, We're talking two days' time. Because the Bible says a day is the Lord's a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Right. Okay, So we're only talking two days' time for God. So it's quick right. you know, to where we are right now. Yes. And, and this is the verse I told you about. Verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, okay? And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Is that okay? Here? That's, right. That's what I told you. We are blessed. Yes, we are. Just by the reading, reading the Bible. Imagine if you study the Bible, like we're doing right now with exactly. Pastor Rick, okay? This is a true blessing. So don't pray for Pastor Rick. That's right. Amen. Pray for us because we know that uh, the devil's mad. 
Mm -hmm. He doesn't want. He didn't want us to know the Bible. That's right. That's more right. than we know. The Bible says study to so, show yourself yeah. approved. Okay. You have to study to show yourself study, approved. Right. Who are you showing yourself approved to? Not yeah. to your fellow man. They, no. they don't want to hear about it. You're showing yourself approved to him. Yes. Okay. Yes. Study to show yourself approved to him. Amen. Amen. Okay. So so we have to be approved to him. Now here, here, you're going to hear some things in the first three chapters of, of Revelation that. We've heard all our lives that, uh, or we've heard in some churches, right? Um, and I'm not sure what how you how you speak it here. So if I say something wrong, after I'm gone, he'll fix it. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> Come on, brother. No, 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 not me, man. <laughs> but you're gonna no find way. in here. We have all these churches that say, "Oh, you don't have to do any works. You don't have to do anything." That's a good one. <laughs> you don't have to do anything in order to be saved. Nothing. You do nothing. He's done it all. Yes. He's done it all. You don't have to do anything. Yes. Well, in the first three chapters of Revelation, you find out a little bit different because when he's talking to the churches, he's talking about their works and the fact that they are doing something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so faith without works is dead, the Word of God says. Yeah. You have to have the Word. If you were in the middle of a burning house and you thought and knew that the house was on fire, would that save you? No. no. Not until you actually do the work of getting up and getting out are you saved. Okay? Just Amen. the knowledge of knowing that it's on fire. Oh, I believe, so I'm saved. Amen. Doesn't save anybody. It takes an action. You work upon that faith that you have. Faith without works is dead. Anyways, um, that's just an aside, but God's good. <laughs> Verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. <laughs> which was... Which is, which is, which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Amen. Who was? <laughs> I know who, who is, but who was? It can't be, it can't be talking about God of the universe, because he never was not. He's always been. So who is this that's saying the one who is and was past tense? And is to come. It would have to be Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's the one that died. Yet, he lives forevermore. Okay? So Jesus Christ is the one talking here in Revelation. Um, and remember, the, the, the revelation of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. One of the things you have to understand about the word prophecy, the word prophecy doesn't mean you're always talking about future events. The word prophecy means you are talking about things that God has asked you to talk about. Whether they're future, past, or present. Amen. Okay? That's prophecy. That's why he calls preachers prophets. They don't have to be teaching things that are going to happen in the future to be preachers, to be prophets. They have to be teaching the word of God, whatever God says. And when they teach what God says, they're prophets. And remember, if you're a prophet of God, everything that comes out of your mouth has to be 100% accurate. Amen. So make sure before you open your mouth they, they know what talking about. <laughs> that you have prayed about it right. and sought the will of God before you spoke it. Amen. So that people will know the words that you say to them come, are coming uh, from God. Truly from the Bible. Are truly from the Word of God. Okay. Sorry. Um, uh, what's four? Well, five, which is five. to come, and five. from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten from the dead, and the prince of kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen. Amen. Okay? How are you washed in his blood? You know it because you mentioned somebody was baptized earlier today. How are you washed in his blood? Right. You're washed by baptism. Yes. Okay? Ephesians chapter 6 tells us that you were washed by baptism. We are buried together with him by baptism. Okay? So it's even bringing us into this here because it's the blood of Jesus that covers us. Amen. From all unrighteousness. 
we were washed in his blood. He hath made us kings and priests unto, his, uh, unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So in that day, when the, 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 that thousand years of peace takes place, the seventh seal takes place, right. that day, a thousand years, that day we're going to be kings and priests because he's going to make us kings and priests yes. over all of those that are left yes. on the earth. Yes. Now, does that mean we can wait for that day before we try to get right with God because we might be left on the earth? I wouldn't, I wouldn't chance it because <laughs> yeah. two-thirds of the earth's population is going to be destroyed. Okay. Two-thirds. So you might be part of the one-third, but I have never been lucky. <laughs> if there's one thing out of three and, 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 and I'm, I'm with two other people, I'm not going to get it. <laughs> it's not going to yeah. come to me, okay? Um, but in this, the Word of God says, hey, you have the choice to make it happen. And that choice is by doing what God has called us to do. You know, Pastor Rick, yes. rapture is much faster and much better. The rapture is. It the definitely rapture. is. It yeah. is. Okay. The catching away, okay? The, yeah. the, 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 the ecclesia, the church being yes. caught away. Um, Thessalonians chapter... Uh, Second Thessalonians chapter, actually, First Thessalonians four, chapter four, talks about the catching away. Yes. Uh, you know, we which are alive in Christ will be caught away to meet up with those that have died in Christ. Um, he goes on to say, "Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him." Even so, Amen. He's trying to tell us. Who it is that we are worshiping. Amen. Who it is that has made it possible for us to have this salvation. So he's starting us off by letting us understand this. Who it is. We know it's Jesus Christ. Okay? He and, is the and, one. And, and, and Pastor Rick, you see here in verse 7. Look, he's coming with the clouds. Yes. Mm -hmm. And every eye will see him. No, when he comes back, second coming, not rapture. It's the second coming. Everybody will see him. People don't know this. People don't, people don't know this. That everybody, everybody, believers, non believers, everybody will see him coming. At the Battle okay? of Armageddon, the second coming. Everybody, yeah. yeah. Okay? So this is something that people, oh, how's, how's it going to come? You will see him coming. <laughs> okay? That's, 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 that's yeah. to be sure. This verse is exactly as it exactly. is here. Exactly. Verse 8. He's speaking again. But now it's in this book, it's in red letters. Because they're, they're attributing Jesus to said. The, the, he says the second coming. He's saying the first coming. That's when the apostles are there. No, no. He's referring, he's referring to the rapture of the church. And then when he calls it the second coming. And that's a good good question. Very, very good question. Because a lot of times people refer to the rapture what, as the second coming. What's her question, yeah. please? She's asking about, are you referring to uh, the first coming then when the, the apostles were here? And know. what? Well, no, what you were referring to is... When he says the second coming, he's referring to the rapture of the church being the first coming, and then Jesus is going to come back with us to fight in the battle of Armageddon. That's in Thessalonians. They're talking about the first. They're talking about the first in Thessalonians chapter 4. Yep. That which is corrupt will become incorrupt. Exactly. Yes. Yep. Exactly. Yep. This, this corruption shall put on, uh, yeah, this corruption shall put on incorruption. This moral shall put on immortality. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the Clouds, which is what you just read here in Revelation. Right. Thessalonians chapter 4 is using the same terms. It's going to be in the clouds. We will be caught up together with them in the yeah. clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But, that's known as the first coming. No, no, that but, is known but, as the first coming, that's yes. Right. That's right. That's one thing. Uh, mm -hmm. The, the coming here depends on the definition of what you say about the first and second coming as he started. The first coming to the earth. Mm -hmm. not, to the, not, not to the church, to the earth. First coming is when he was, well, when he incarnated. Exactly. When he, he came born. Yeah, when he to earth. Yeah. He incarnated. He, he became a, a man. Okay? That's the first coming to the earth. The second coming is this on verse 7. When he comes to the earth. Because he will come before to the church. But he'll, 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 want he'll only be in the clouds. He'll be only in the clouds. And we'll exactly. meet him in the clouds. Yeah. Okay? But... The second coming to the earth is only on what we read here on verse 7. Okay? When he's on the earth. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, that's, and, and it's awesome, and I'm glad you're asking the question, because it means you have some understanding of... Uh, well, I, read, I read it with a commentary. Okay. Tyndale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tyndale does great stuff with, with yeah. Bibles and whatnot. It is one of the better. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But we are here for that. We are to yeah, ask yeah. questions. Exactly. Clear so down. Slow me learn. down. Whatever you have to slow me down. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. We have, according to Pastor, I have all. I yes. Have, I have years. We have plenty of time. We have plenty of time. Please. I have so much that I'd like to get to, and so so I get anxious yes, and I want to get it's, it's deep, But it's you deep. can't do that. You deep, you, you've got to slow down so that everybody yeah. gets it. And I understand it, and I thank yeah. you for for causing me to do that because there's just so much that you oh man I mean me you know, and, and so you try to do this. So yes, the first coming was when he came on the earth the first time as as a as a baby and grew up as a man and right. was uh, crucified. The second coming is when he comes to earth the second time. To the earth, yeah. yeah to the earth a second time, when he's actually on the earth. Exactly. The rapture is when he's in the clouds still. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, the rapture from Thessalonians, though, it's referred to as the first coming, isn't it? No, it's not, actually. He's, it's called the resurrection of the dead. Okay. Oh. It's called the resurrection of the dead. He doesn't call it the first coming. He calls it the resurrection. He says, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord in the air. Right. It doesn't actually use the term first coming. Okay. It uses at the last trump. If, again, if you understand it's Jewish. It's like after you're dead also, God chooses his people again. And he takes them off. After you're dead? After you're dead, he also chooses exact. There's another point in time. Yes, yeah. He's, well, he's, he's referring, Jesus actually talked about that in Matthew 24, that the, that all of those that died in Christ, mm -hmm. even in the Old Testament. Yes, everybody. Funny, it's, funny, yeah. it's funny how you can die in Christ, yes. but Christ is only a New Testament yes. deity. Yeah, you know, yeah. if, if our mentality is, is so far-fetched. Yes. Christ wasn't just a New Testament deity. He's an Old Testament deity. He's a God of two testaments, okay? Yes, yes. But he was in the Old Testament because the world was created by him. Right. And without him, 1 right. John chapter 1, was not anything right. made that was made. So he was in the Old Testament. But um, we find out that, that Jesus Christ, when he came, he came to save us. And then it says, when he left, he went to the Mount of Olives, Mount of Mount all of that, he went to Mount and he rose up. From Mount Olivet, and they said when he was watching, when they were watching him, the angel said, "Why stand you here gazing? In like manner, he will return again." Well, he rose up into the clouds. When he comes back, he's going to be coming into the clouds. That's the rapture. That's the catching away of the saints. Those that have lived for him and died, they aren't in heaven yet. Again, that's another theology that we have. Yeah, that's another theology that we have. But if you read. Yeah. It's a theology, but if you read the Word of God, the Word of God says that when somebody dies, they go to a place called Abraham's bosom, a place of slumber or sleep. Okay, They go into this place called Abraham's bosom, and they're there, and it passes as if no time has passed at all. It, it, it's, it's a flash. And then the dead in Christ rise first, then we which are alive remain are caught up together with them. Because he tells us that, that we are sleeping until... until the Lord calls it. It's but ready. remember that in the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses was there. Okay. Right? And yes. Yes. Moses and Elijah. And Elijah yeah. were there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they were yeah. in heaven with God and they came right there yeah. to talk and, to and, Jesus. And, and, and Moses, okay. Moses was never, Moses was never, his body was never found. No, but he was buried because the devil, the devil went. God buried him. Yeah. Though. Yeah. God buried him. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. God buried him. But yeah. the devil yeah. wanted his body. And Enoch. Enoch never. He never, never died, died either. Physically, he, he was caught physically. up with God. So there's, there's yeah, Elijah too. What, what I'm and saying, he, he went up to heaven. He yeah. didn't go down. Right. No, no, I understand. But what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, if we look at, and we can get off on a tangent on this, but if we look at the word of God, the word of God says that those people that have died, uh -huh. they were in a place called Abraham's bosom, a place of slumber. Yeah. That, that's that's the word. It's a place. In other words, when you die, are mortal. Because, because if you continue in Thessalonians, because in Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, Now concerning those which are asleep. That's how yeah, he starts yeah, it off. Yeah, That's but, how he starts yeah, it off. Yeah, concerning okay, those which are asleep. several so, yeah, definitions for that. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. Jesus Christ talked, said to the, 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 new, the, the good thief, 
Yeah. You, I, you, oh, I, 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 today you will be today with me. You be, yeah. Today you'll be paradise with me. Paradise is in heaven. Yeah. And, uh, well, but maybe, again, let, in, let's in, go in, back yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. Let's yeah, go that could be, be, yeah, be a thought for another day, but. To verse this, eight. This is verse a long study as to why yeah. I believe that. But yeah, we, we, can, to we can go on to that uh, at a point. All I'm saying is sometimes we need to, uh, we need to just look at, again, what does the word say? Let's study it out. Let's see what it says. And again, if I'm wrong, he'll correct me, and, and he'll fix. He'll fix. He'll fix what I what I say. My own personal belief is that because I read the Word of God that says those things. Again, uh -huh. that's not a heaven or hell issue. <laughs> that that okay. in, that in and of itself is not. So we don't need to worry about that. Anyways, verse eight says, "I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending." Okay, saith the Lord, which is which was and which is to come the almighty Miami. so if anybody tells you anything other than jesus christ has all the power to take care of every need that we have you look at this one verse and you say no no, no. he's got it all if he's almighty then there's no power for anybody else why is that because jesus christ rolled himself in flesh became a human being and died for your sin and mine, okay? He didn't just look on the cross back then and look at who was there, but he looked, remember there's no time with God, he looked into the future at Joe, at myself, and all of you that are here and said, I need to do this for you. I need to do this for you. Right. Because I want you to be with me in paradise. <laughs> and so so he did that for us. So he's the almighty, he is, he is, he is the only potentate, the word of God says. Um, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and you shall call his name Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And what was his name? His name was Jesus. Amen. Okay? So we have to have an identity. Jesus said, I'm coming in my Father's name. So, you know... It's important to understand who he is. And, 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 and the revelation of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. I, John, also am your brother and companion in tribulation. And in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in tribulation. I had my own personal tribulation. Uh, John is telling us, and his was being on the Isle of Patmos. He was actually tired and feathered and left there for dead you know, on the Isle of Patmos. And I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So he's hearing a booming loud voice saying, and again, the same words, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, that what thou seest right in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with garment down to the foot, and girt about with uh, the paps with a golden girdle, and his head, uh, his his I'm sorry, his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as the flame of fire. <laughs> Doesn't look like Michelangelo's picture, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Some long-haired hippie dude that's you know, sitting there, you know, very effeminate looking. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like that to me. And this is the only. Sorry, but this is the only description I have of what Jesus looked like. Yeah. And the whole word of God doesn't tell me other than the fact that he was not comely to look upon in one verse. It says, uh, And his feet like unto fine brass, as they were burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And many waters um, is often ref referenced in the Bible as being multitudes of people. In other words, his voice, he could talk as though Everybody could hear it and, and could listen to him. As the voice of many waters, he could talk to everyone. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of the mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth uh, in his strength. 
And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. He wanted everybody to know. He's all in all. Yeah. I'm the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of death Amen. and of yes. hell. And, and what he's trying to tell John at this point is, I have your back. Trust me. Amen. Trust me. I know exactly what you're going through. And you don't have a worry in the world. I'll take care of it for you. Amen. I will take care of it. And he says, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. In other words, write the things that you've just looked at. Write the things that you know are. And write the things that I'm going to show you are going to happen later on. Okay? Then he says, the mystery of the seven stars. Because we don't have to understand, worry or wonder what the seven stars is. Because God tells us what the seven stars are. The seven stars are angels, believe it or not. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven golden candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. I want you to understand, just in the very first chapter of the book of Revelation, he wants us to know and understand who Jesus is. Then he wants us to know and understand who his workmen are. Who are the people that he in, empowers to do things? One of the things I want you to catch in this in, in Rome, is the fact that he's letting us know that for every church, he's talking about the seven churches in Asia, for every single church, there is an angel that God puts in that church. Yeah. Yeah. There is an angel in that church watching over that church. Personally, I tend, again, it's my own personal thing. I tend to believe the angel that God puts in the church is the pastor of that church. I really believe that God has placed an angel in the church and he talks to the pastor of the church so that the pastor knows what the church itself needs. The angel isn't, isn't the pastor. What I'm saying is the, the pastor has that angel that he can talk to, that God can give him understanding and direction. That's, again, that's, that's, that's given. That's a, my, my own personal belief. That's not that I can't mm -hmm. base that on the Bible. Um, isn't there a verse somewhere in the New Testament that says we all have an angel? Mm -hmm. It does. It does. We all have angels watching over us. And I, it uses the term angels. So they may, we may have even right. more than one. More yeah. Than one like yeah, we may have even more than one. Where is that verse? I don't know exactly where it is right now. I, I'd have to... I don't have them all 100% in my head. But. There's a song about angels watching over you. Yeah, yeah. The guardian angels, God will keep you all yeah. in the yeah. night. Yeah. He, he has angels. Now, I'm not sure if there's, you know, every one of us has at least one assigned to us, but there are multiple angels, you know, and, and they come in unity. What happens is when we pray, we have power with the angels. Do you, know why, do you know why the Word of God says that a woman has long hair? It's so that she'll have power with the angels. Her hair is given as a covering, but her long hair gives her power with the angels. Okay? And so, so it's, it's a, a way of making a covenant with God. There was another covenant with God was, was that a man was to have short hair. Okay? That was his covenant with God. Unless God had a Nicene oath that he had to take, and then he couldn't cut his hair like Samson. You know, but God, that, was a, that, was a, that, was, that was that was an aside, not a not not the norm. Okay, but God has covenants that He will do with us. He doesn't have the same thing for everybody, so we, we can't expect everybody to have the exact same calling that God has placed on any any one of us. But yes, we all have angels, and if we if we can continue in chapter two, and I want to try to uh, what time is it? Okay, let's still have time. Okay, I want to try. I just want to try to get an understanding of now who the churches are, because what He does in chapter two and chapter three is he talks to the churches, and he lets the churches know what they're doing right, Okay. but he also lets the churches know what they're doing wrong. So he says, unto, and he tells John, unto the church of Laodicea, right? Unto the church of Thyatira, right? Unto the, every time he talks about it, he says, unto the church. He's telling John to write to the church. If the angels, if the angels are sitting there with God... Why would John have to tell the angels what to do? Right. <laughs> okay, so is it maybe God saying that, hey, I want to talk to my person that I've assigned to this church 
to take care yeah, of this church. Right, right. And, and let not him know to the what angel, to but to the, to the authority the, there. Exactly, the authority of the church. Right. Because the angel is basically a spirit, is what he goes on to tell us here. So right. let's go chapter 2. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So remember, if you don't remember anything else, remember God is always walking in the midst of the church. God is always walking Amen. in your midst. Okay? He's there. He's in the midst of the church. And know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles but are not and hast found them liars. Oh, he said, I'm talking to you. Let you know. Because sometimes we get upset when people do that. And God's trying to tell, trying to tell them that sometimes your being upset isn't what I need to further the church. I can be upset about it, but I don't need you right. upset about it. I need you doing my job and my, yeah, my calling. We are with chapter 2, verse chapter two, 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. Yeah. Verse 3 now. Yeah. And so, so we, we, have to, we, we have to understand that he's telling them, I know your works. So they weren't just sitting back on their laurels doing nothing. They were actually working. Okay? They were actually doing something. Right. Um, and has born, verse 3, and has, uh, uh, I'm sorry, and has born and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Everything that we do, we should do for the name of Jesus Christ. Again, the reason uh, uh, the first three chapters of the book are preaching to the church. It's not really telling me prophecy. It's preaching to the church. Right. So this could be just a sermon that uh, any pastor could give at any given time. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. Wow. And that's the time when we get a little upset. When God calls somebody to talk to us <laughs> instead of calling us. <laughs> it's like, I got something against you. <laughs> it's hard to hear from somebody we else, you know. Lives. God, why didn't you just tell me? Because you weren't listening. <laughs> yes. I tried to tell you, but you wouldn't listen. Yes. So, so, so God, God calls and, and says, nevertheless, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because thou hast left thy first love. Because thou hast left thy first love. Do you know what the first love of the church of Ephesus was? Their, their love for God and their fellow man. Chapter 2, verse... Chapter 2, verse 2. No, Revelation. The next book, yeah. Then verse... Um, two. Chapter 2, and that was verse uh, uh, 4. Verse 4. Yeah. Okay. okay. The, church, the church at Ephesus, they had love. That was their, that was their they were the, the church of love. They really were. And all of a sudden, they started looking at things that people were doing wrong, rather than loving like they had been loving, and they were finding fault with all the things that were going on. That's why he says... Because of your diligence in finding all this that you're seeing here, I see that. But I have ought against you because you lost your first love. Your first love was to win people to me. That used to be, that was your first love. Get them in the church. Don't worry about what they look. Let me take care of that. Right. But now all of a sudden you're trying to clean them up before you get them in the church. <laughs> right. Sometimes we try to go out there and we try to clean them up before we bring them into the shower. Isn't that what the shower is for? You know, it's not my job to clean them up. That's God's job. That's God's job. Amen. My job is to tell them who He is and why Amen. they should know Him. Amen. His job is to clean them, to take care of them. That's His job. Okay. And so He says, "I have all against you because you lost your first love. Your first love was you weren't. You're not out there reaching souls anymore. You're not out there trying to." You know, evangelize and bring people into the church. Instead, you'd rather look at all the things that they're doing wrong rather than say, forget what they're doing wrong. Get them in the church. Amen. They're hungry. They need something. Bring them in. Bring them in. Uh, and verse, uh, verse 5, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Get back to it. And do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of the uh, out of his place, except thou repent. Pastor was saying a couple of weeks ago that one of the worst doctrines out there, or the biggest uh, uh, doctrine that causes more people to lose out with God, 
is the once saved, always saved doctrine. <laughs> that doctrine is saying, hey, once I'm saved, I can never go astray. Right. Well, actually, according to this, you can, because he says if you don't change, if you don't repent, they've already had their first love, so they were already in the church. If you don't repent, I'm going to wipe your name out of the book of life. Right. He says it in another verse <laughs> to another one of the churches, I'll wipe your name out of the book of life. Well, in order for my name to be wiped out of the book of life, it had to be in the book of life. Yeah. So, again, as an aside, but this is revelation. It's, you know, we're not prophetic yet. We're talking to the church and the problem with the church. But we wanted to go through this verse by verse, so let's, let's continue it. Um, excuse me. Uh, Six. Okay. okay. Uh, actually, he says, he says, or I will, uh, I will, uh, excuse me, first words, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove the candlestick from out of its place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Do you... He, he talks about, in a, in a couple of verses down the road, he talks about, again, the Nicolaitans right. and, and Balaam down the road. Uh, so if you're anything like me, you try to find, what is, what, what is the Nicolaitans? Who are the Nicolaitans? Good question. Who are the Nicolaitans? If you don't know who the Nicolaitans were, the Nicolaitans were a group of people that were Christians, and they were in the church, and all of a sudden, they came, they, 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 they had a revelation of a greater deed where they could get more people into church. And so they started going along with the, uh, 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 the Roman goddess, gods and goddesses and the Greek gods and goddesses and allowing them to have uh, uh, um, adulterous relationships. Nicholas, who was the guy, if you look at history, Nicholas was the, was, was the leader of this group. He would let them you know, have their way with his wife and all the you know, swapping and, and all this going on in the church. And so it was, it was, it was considered... A bad there was, there was fornication in the church and adultery in the church, and it wasn't you know it shouldn't be allowed. And he says, he says, I you know the way of the Nicolaitans, I hate it. But the biggest thing that he hated about the Nicolaitans, because Balaam, the Balaamites, they did the same thing. He talks about them in a minute. The the, the, the Balaamites did the same thing. But the biggest thing that he hated about the Nicolaitans was the Nicolaitans believed that they had to control each and every member. <laughs> they had to take and, and force everyone to do their will or they wouldn't be part of the church. Okay? He forced the will of God upon them rather than being a service of love. It became a forced service. That was what the Nicolaitans were known for. And so that was one of the bigger things that they were known for is the fact that they were trying to keep them by saying, if you don't listen to me, you're going straight to hell. Use fear to keep them in the church rather than using the love of God. That's why he talks about your first love was love. Amen. Your first love was love. Now you've gone away from that and you're trying to teach and preach you know, uh, hard doctrines to keep people in the church and hate or, or fear to keep people in the church rather than love to keep them in the church. You lost your first love, okay? So, so he tells us that. Then he goes on to say, um, and unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, these things saith the first and the last. Again, he's letting you know who he is, which was, uh, which was dead and is alive, I know thy works. Again, he's letting them know he knows their works. So, so verse works. 8, right? Verse 8 now? Yeah, it was verse 8. Yep. Verse 8, okay. Yep, verse 8. And, and uh, actually, verse 9 now. I know thy works. He's letting them know again. He knows the things that they're doing. So works, according to all of these churches in, in, in Asia, works were an important thing. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. <laughs> I know your poverty, but you're rich. You just got to look at what you're rich in, not in what you think you're poor in. <laughs> right, right. Look at the right place and you'll know that you're actually rich and not, not in poverty. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. There's some people, again, teaching what they say is religious truth, but it's not religious truth. It's, synagogue of, it's, it's from the synagogue of Satan. 
a lot of it is easy believism. That you can, you can, you can live for God easy. And you know what? <laughs> the term is, is, is it's, somebody, somebody said it's hard to live for God. I say, if you live for God hard, it's easy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can't live easy for God because it's not going to happen. But if you live hard for God, Amen. it becomes easy because he makes up the difference. You realize what grace is? Grace is not saying you can sit on your laurels and do nothing and God covers you. That's not what grace is. Grace says you can't do everything that I need you to do to live up to the law. But if you give me 100%, I'll make up the difference. That's grace. Okay? You'll never go out there and try to help anybody, any of you, try to help anybody do anything if you think they're not putting in effort themselves. If you see them and they're just sitting back and they're letting you do all the work, it won't be long before you say, forget it, I'm not helping you. But if you see that they're giving their all to get what they need, you don't mind helping them to get it. That's the same thing. That's what grace is. God says, you don't have what it takes, but I'll make up the difference for you. That's why I came and died yeah. for you. Um, I know thy work. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, okay, verse 10. Fear none of those things. Don't worry about those things, the ones that are coming against you. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Don't worry about it, he says. If you have to get cast into prison, you'll be there for a short time. It's not a big deal. It, it's not like it's, it's, it's something that's going to kill your soul. Okay? As long as you give your life to me, I will give you a crown of life when it's all done, said and done. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not, hurt, uh, shall not be hurt of the second death. Okay? If we die once, then we have to worry about a second death. But if we die, if we die, you know, physically die, then there's a second death, a spiritual death that's going to happen. But if we die in this life out to Christ, and then we die physically, we don't have to worry about the second death because we've already got it covered by dying out the first time to Jesus Christ. Okay? So we don't have to worry about the second death. Verse 12, and to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things which saith he that hath the sharp, toward, uh, the sharp sword with the two edges, I know thy works. He's got this thing about works. And where thou uh, uh, dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name. You know where Satan's seat is, but you still hold to my name. Again, it's Jesus talking, so they're holding to his name. Amen. The name of Jesus Christ. Don't ever deny Jesus Christ. You know my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein uh, Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against you. Again, he built them up, which is what we should do, build people up. And then if God tells us to act, say something else, then we have to say that else. But the first thing you do is you edify. That's the whole idea behind the church. Edify, mm -hmm. build up. Don't, don't. Tear down. You see that this this verse uh, thirteen, okay? Verse thirteen that you just read is not only for today, but has been applied for generations. Yes, it has since it was written, because many many people, many Christian people have already been persecuted and, and died until today, but but. You know, during the during history, you, 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 we saw that, okay? And so this, these words are not only for us today, no. in the last days, but all those years before that, people have been 
healed, like it says here. And that's why Thessalonians mm -hmm. says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Right. Those that have died, this is the death he's talking about. Right. That, that those that have died living for Christ, right. they're going to rise first when the rapture happens, and then we're going to be caught up together right. with them in the clouds. Right. And so shall we ever be there. And it's only going to be a split second. You know, it's a twinkling of an eye. So it's not right. going to be that much of a difference between exactly. uh, timing-wise. Exactly. But it's going to be. But we're going to be together with them, and we're going to be right. worshiping and praising God with them uh, when we're in heaven. Verse 14, but I have a few things against you because thou hast, uh, hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, he's, this is where he's talking about Balaam and the Nicolaitans again. Right. Because these guys have, have held the doctrine of Balaam, um, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. <laughs> Balaam was putting curses on the people of God. Right. Okay, and God says, look. We can't be doing that. You, we can't be putting things in a way for people trying to live for God. Okay? You can't be doing that. So Balaam was doing things that were, or, or the, the spirit of Balak was doing things that were creating a stumbling block for the children of God. Israel is always representative of the church, Old Testament-wise. Um, so even of the church. To eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So he's, he's letting us know here that that's what the spirit of the Nicolaitans were as well. And the Balaamites and the, and the Nicolaitans were to, to have uh, fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So he's letting you know that that's the doctrine that he's talking about. So he mentions that twice in Nicolaitans. And again, the idea of trying to get somebody to live for God out of fear is, is, is probably one of the things that God hates more than anything. God says, you know, I don't want you to be cowering every time, you know, you hear something that's coming down the pike cowering because you're afraid of me. Right. You know, how many how many of you as parents wanted when you got home your children hiding from you rather than meeting you at the door with open arms, right. ready to see you and happy to see you? I mean, I grew up I grew up in a house where where every time we did something, my mother would say, Wait till your father gets home. <laughs> she would say that to us. So when my father got home, we were hiding because we didn't want yeah. My father didn't like that. He didn't want to have to, when, we, when, when, when he got home, he wanted to have a good time with us. Amen. We do that a lot in we the church nowadays, that. and we get people to fear God, not a Bible fear, in other words, a fear, a healthy knowledge, head knowledge fear of God, but a fear of, I'm afraid to even look at God or talk to God because I'm bad. God says, I've already paid that price. Talk to me. I've already paid that price for you. Amen. I paid it this way. Talk to me. And so we can't give them that. So if we have the spirit of the Nicolaitans, that's what we do. We try to use fear to get people to live for God. And that's not God's way of, 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 yeah. of doing no, it. No, he says here, uh, exactly what he said in terms of, uh, you, he says here in our version, you yeah. have people there who hold to the teach of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Exactly. You know, and to, nowadays you you see this. In it's churches, all over the place. Churches that allow uh, you to do whatever you want. They don't condemn you by your sins. You can be whatever you want to be as long as you come to church and read the Bible. You're you're, you're okay. And these people. Read the Bible. They come to church. Uh, today, I saw a video about uh, a young guy that was being uh, interviewed by a, by a Christian reporter, okay? And he says, I'm a Christian. Oh, I'm a Christian, yeah, I'm a Christian. Uh, I go to church every Sunday, I sing, and, you know, and I have a wonderful service. And I said, but... The report said, but aren't you gay? He said, yes, I'm gay. But we all go to church, <laughs> me and my friends. And, you know, uh, we know that the Bible says very clear about this. You know, we love the homosexuals, we, we do, as people. Yes. And not only homosexuals, anybody, man. That's right. We talk about homosexuals, it could be adulterer, yep. robbers, thieves. You know, fornicators, all those people, and the churches, many churches accept them. They know that the the brother is a is a daughter, the sister uh, is uh, does 
sexual morality too, you know, and people just don't say anything. Maybe because the sister is a singer, the, the man is a pastor or whatever. And, and, and this is what it's talking about here, that some churches allowed this sexual morality to happen and did nothing. So that's why he's condemning here on the book of Revelation yes. about those churches. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, he's, and he's telling them that they can't be doing those things that are wrong yeah. and don't allow it in the church. Exactly. But, but he's saying teach it in a way of edifying and building up and letting them see where yes. the love of Christ will overpower that evil one, Satan, okay, yeah. uh, the devil. We have to love them into wanting to do what's right. We can't, exactly. we can't beat them over the head because, right. and, and I, I totally agree, and hopefully I didn't come across sounding like I was trying to say we don't have to preach you know, uh, holiness in the, in the church. We do. We, we have to preach what God tells us, to preach the word of God and preach it over the pulpit and not allow sin to overtake the churches. I'm right. not saying that in any way, shape, or form. What I'm saying is there are some churches out there that you have people that are in the churches and they're doing their best to live for God. Yes. And they're not doing all of those things, but all the day-to-day -day life, there are things that, that somebody else thinks are wrong that they shouldn't be doing. And so they're putting their own doctrine or twist on it and then telling the people, oh, you've got to live exactly up to my standards. I have heard in the church and I don't know any of you have ever, but I have heard in the church that until you get your own convictions, live by mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do that. Now, God, if God wants me to do something, when I repent and I say, Lord, please forgive me for everything I've ever done and, and, and truly repent for what I have done right. and I seek the Lord in that, when I come to true repentance, guess what repentance means? It means 180 degrees. That's what the word repent. When you're in the arm and you're marching this way and the, and the commander yells repent, you turn right around completely and go the opposite direction. That's what repent means. Right. I'm walking down this path living the life that I'm living right now. And when God says repent, I have to stop going that way and go the exact opposite direction. All of the things that I lust and long for are here. And I have to turn and say, God, no, I'm going your way. Thank you. Right. And I have to turn away from sin. So sin is not a lot, and hopefully I wasn't trying to, I hope I didn't make you think that I was trying to say sin was a lot. I'm not. But what I am saying is you can't live for any of the people in the church, and you can't force them to live the way that you live. You have to let God be the one to do that, you know. Uh, it can't be you doing it. Says it says here, be God. verse 16, repent. Yes, exactly. Right. Repent. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth, he that hath an ear again, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, he's not going to do it to the ones that didn't overcome. To the ones that overcome, will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. You Amen. want a new name? Amen. Overcome means if, if there are things that are, that are, that are sinful that, that, that you want to do or, or you feel led to do or, or, or enticed, that's what the word ba Balaam and Balak, enticed yeah. them to do that. Things that are enticing you to do it, if you say no and go the opposite direction, that's an overcomer. Yeah, somebody that's yeah, doing yeah. things that somebody that's doing things to to make their life better. And to be an overcomer means to be victorious. Yes. Upon your sin. Upon your sin. If you know that you have sin that is bugging you, killing you, it kills you. It's brutal. And then you have to overcome that sin. If you exactly. don't overcome it, you 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 don't you won't go to heaven because you have to be an overcomer, not through you, but to the power yeah. of God yeah, exactly. in you. Jesus Christ will give you the power to be an overcomer. You can only be an overcomer through Christ. Exactly. Because he's the only one. That's what grace yeah. is. We yeah. don't have it on our own to be the overcomer. But the grace of Jesus yes. Christ makes only. us that overcomer. Because yeah. he perfects us. The word of God says that, that it was for the perfecting, the teaching, the preaching. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. <laughs> that the preaching of the gospel is for the perfecting of the saints. Does that mean the saints are perfect? No. no. Jesus did say, though, be ye perfect, for I am perfect. Yet, he never expected us to be perfect. What he meant was strive for it. Strive for that perfection, and I'll make up the difference. Right. And I will only see the perfection. Right. 
because I covered the rest of it, which is an amazing and, and, and an awesome thing when, when God can do that for us. Um, I know it's, it's... We have one minute. Okay. One minute, no, two minutes. Okay. Um, so instead of continuing on right now, because we're going to another church now at, at this point, it, 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 it's a long drawn out thing by doing this one, one verse at a time, but it's giving us an understanding of the church. And, and again, we all think the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, we all think Revelation is all prophetic. It right. wasn't. This was letting the churches know how they should live in the very beginning. And right. it was letting them know who Jesus was. Uh, and so, so we're seeing this. Chapter 4 will tell us about the things of the future. And that it really gets <laughs> flying, flying right. fast. So, um, so we'll pick up from here next time uh, and, and continue on. But understand that, that the word of God all of it is prophetic, every bit of it, because it's prophesying to me. Amen. And prophesying just means preach the word. Amen. Preach the word of God.